I was going to be very confused there for a moment. All right. So what we get to see is, let me give everybody a quick rundown of how the timeline for this worked out. I went to bed last night at like nine o'clock. Sometime between nine and midnight when I woke up, Dave sent an email like, hey, would you be uh, available to talk tomorrow? I, I woke up and I couldn't get back to sleep. So I was like, sure, why not? I went through several talks I had semi-ready and semi-formatted and uh, eh, I decided to just write a new one. So I decided to take a shot at uh, 10 big, the next 10 big things in Linux kernel. Uh, some of these are 518, some are other ones. Hey, Chad, can you mute? Thank you. So um, I've spoken here a bunch over the time. If anybody has any questions or comments, please let me know. Uh, Dave will monitor the chat window. I, of course, Jonathan, well, I'm really bad at that. 
I would say if I start to mumble, please let me know, but it's gonna happen. We just all know it. We just accept it. Just embrace that. Um, all of this is just my opinion. I could very well be wrong. At this point, most talks about Linux, I drop a mention that approximately 30 years ago, I was a huge Minix user. The same, same time Torvald was. And I was reading this news group called Comp OS Minix. And there came on there an email from a guy from Finland uh, saying, hey, I'm gonna write a little OS so I can be big and professional like, uh, like uh, the GNU herd and stuff like that. And I saw so it and went, huh, that's not gonna amount to anything. So I'm not always right on that stuff. And in my defense at the time, the way it was licensed and stuff, I didn't think it would actually amount to anything. But when you change the license to, to uh, the GNU GPL and stuff like that, it really changed things. And also the fact that herd took forever. So it filled the need. So, but I am not always right on it. Well, forever is the, you can actually run a new herd today. It's, it's interesting in its own right, but it's got limitations still like two gig file systems here or that, or this. They fixed all of the bunch of them, but still an evolving thing over time. But these are some of the things called my fancy. So number 10, the 2011 version of C is being going to be used for the kernel to compile it. Right now, the Linux kernel uses the 1989 version of the C to compile the Linux kernel. That gives you a whole bunch of limitations. They've been working towards this for a number of years and just finally said, hey, you know what? Let's get into this century. Let's take that giant leap. And some of the stuff you get with, with, with that is you get like uh, four scope initializers and stuff like that. So you can define your uh, int i equals and the for loops and stuff like that inside brackets and stuff like that. You get some cleanup, you get some proof code generation. There's some enhancements to it. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a not a bad thing. I would have kind of almost like see uh, C make the jump all the way to C2X, but that is a bridge too far. That is a, that would break a bunch of stuff and not all the tool chains and stuff like that support that currently. But this is a really nice thing about it because it's gonna allow cleaning up some code, fixing some stuff. If anybody wants to get some uh, easy kernel commits, I would suggest you look at the difference between C98 and uh, 2011 and figure out what they are and start submitting patches to bring it in line with specs. They did a whole lot of programmatically, but it's still happening. So it's not too bad. C is still an evolving language, keep that in mind. There are still new versions of C being developed, which is kind of weird because one of the last changes I remember about C was they adopted the C++ single, uh, single line comment style, which is slash slash and then just put your stuff on there. It's like, oh, that's nice, but but it's continuing to evolve. It's continuing to do stuff and it's getting better. And also one of the nice things about this is it's going to enable newer versions of the GNU C compiler and LLVM, which is a very nice thing. It's all right because LLVM is the low level virtual machine compiler stuff. Uh, Clang is a very nice compiler. It's used by Apple. It's uh, one that's been around for a number of years and works pretty well for most stuff. For a long time there, there was also the Intel C compiler, which is fortunately kind of I have not seen any progress on that in a long time because I used to run a site called uh, Linux ICCC, uh, um, ICC, which is nothing but compiling the Linux kernel with the uh, Intel C compiler and putting out all the warnings and stuff that it had, the other ones didn't. And it got some patches that way. So people were taking, taking them, look, looking at advantages of it. And someone else, another project to theoretically do, uh, mm -hmm. if you were to follow GCC, the GitHub repo, that their most up-to-date version compile the kernel with that, get their stuff in there, all the flags and stuff like that. That'd be interesting for reports and some feedback, and stuff like that. So it's interesting, it's all right, but that is supposed to happen at 518. I have not been reading the Linux kernel mail list the last couple of weeks. I've been busy with some other stuff. So I'm not sure if that actually is in there yet or not. Um, <laughs> LSM module stacking. If anybody who's been a victim of a SE Linux understands what would be better than SE Linux? SE Linux and another one working together to cause you pain and suffering. Because over time, all of the uh, various Linux security modules wax and work. There's Smack, there's Tomoyo Linux, there's App Armor, there's uh, SE Linux, and there's a couple other ones out there. I mean, any crack pot can come their own. Hell, I had one I was working on, but I never got crazy enough to finish it. But the idea here is you can start stacking them. App Armor is actually supporting the capability for you to stack App Armor on top of SE Linux so you can have two sets of security policy so you can have it doing 
additional checks and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the right look, Dave. A look at perplexion and fear. Because, well, yes. My, my thought on that was, uh, you know, in the DOD world, uh, that would be a stick, a stick finding if it was, if, if something accidentally yeah, well, no, they're, they're complimentary. They'll, they'll just seriously double block. Yeah. They're, not, they're double screwed, not single. So Bruce's comment. What's Bruce's comment? <laughs> Is it clean enough to say for a family show? Yes, yeah, so it will be a few years before they use rust. Uh, actually, once again, Bruce is jumping ahead. <laughs> But it's it's some interesting stuff. It it, it is doing some cool stuff. Um, they're making progress in this. Their app one, we just turned in a couple of more patches to make their stuff more stackable. Um, the ability to do this for like really high street environments, like industrial type stuff, there is some potential. Each one has its own place. Uh, if you look at like Smack, Tomoyo, there's some serious synergies there between the two of them. And they can do some stuff in terms of uh, you start looking at the comp capability in the future of an LSM that does uh, training type modules where you actually audit, audit the whole kernel, figure out what portion of it your system uses, stuff like that. There's some potential there for being able to stack those modules. Uh, yeah, but uh, the app, st app armor stacking, this has been around for, this idea has been around for years. And I went out to the How To Forge the other day just to take a look around and did a quick search for disable SE Linux. And it's still way up there on the on the number of articles that suggest that when you have problems. So it's working halfway as decently for most of this stuff for us nowadays. Yeah. But, uh, number eight, new random number generator. There have been some significant changes in the Linux RNG system. Uh, dev random and dev u random are now the same. That is a big change how it works out. Uh, quick quiz. What was the difference between dev random and dev random in the past? Uh, you, says Bruce. <laughs> oh, kill me, Bruce. The answer, dev random was more secure, uh, but can block if you didn't have enough entropy. If you've ever generated PGP, uh, GPG keys, and you had to say, jiggle the mouse more, do more random stuff, and you're sitting there going like, I'm doing as much as I can here. I'm working, working it pretty good. <laughs> it's like, what's the problem? Not enough entropy, not enough entropy. So you actually have to, there's certain commands you can do on rel systems to uh, increase the amount of entropy and stuff like that to precede and all that kind of stuff to help feed it out. But the ability to uh, fix this is really nice because they made some serious enhancements to the way it works and they've just changed the way it works. It uh, does some synthetic benchmarks and stuff to prime the uh, system. Because random number generation is obviously very important for cryptography. Every time you do an SSL tunnel, that kind of SSH, SSL connection, that kind of stuff, you really would like some uh, good random number generators there. Because if you don't have that, you're getting very predictable. Years ago, there was a, a patch made to Debian's SSH where there's a bunch of variables that are uninitialized. And someone going through the code said, hey, these are uninitialized. I will set them all to zero. And the problem with that was all of a sudden everybody started getting the same keys. And that was very, very bad because the way it wasn't, desi it wasn't designed this way, it was just a, a fluke. It was random because it, they weren't initialized values. So it worked out for people until they actually fixed it. Like somebody read a warning and actually uh, did it. So that's an example where warnings can actually be bad. But um, yeah. So with the new changes, both the devices return the same data. So no reason to pick choose between them. Just use dev random and be happy. Life is good. Life is better than it's ever been in that respect. Um, so some of the other enhancements has been sped up a lot. Initialization is much faster than the system initially boosts if you're having it do stuff up front with, that, with the encryption. Very, very nice. Um, one other thing they've added in this later, 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 most recently, uh, it detects it's running in a VM. And it's so a remix of the entropy, because theoretically there were some attacks that you could get two systems running at the same time and clone them exactly right. You could actually get the same random num number generation out of both systems, out of both copies of the system, which of course is bad if you're talking things like BDI and stuff like that. So 
It's very nice. They've done some work with that. It's a really nice little thing. It's not a huge change to it, but it's uh, if you spend any time hanging around the crypto subsections of Linux and stuff like that, it's always something that's uh, find interesting. <clears throat> this one I put into the the uh, category. Uh, Intel software upgradable CPU. If you're old like I am, you remember you remember years and years ago when there used to be a Top USA down in 78 78 in Dodge. And they actually sold these laptops where you can actually, you're right next to the laptop, there's a little set of stands of little cards. And you can pick one of these cards up and you can use that to unlock the CPU in your machine to run faster. And it only worked on Windows, to the best of my knowledge. If you put Linux on that, it would turn the laptop into a full speed demon machine. But they, they had this, this capability and they uh, decided to do this. Um, what I find really interesting about that is we're coming full circle on this. This is a big change in the way CPUs are handled inside the Linux kernel. And this has gone in really quietly. There's not been a lot of feedback on this one, which really makes me wonder. So um, the idea is you buy a CPU, some of the cores are turned off, cache is turned off, something's turned off. And then you can buy something from Intel to re-enable it. And so you now all of a sudden are able to unleash the full power of the system. Um, this isn't a new idea. Intel tried this back, like we mentioned, the early 2000s. IBM has also done something with, similar to this with mainframes for decades. You could actually uh, buy a mainframe with so many CPUs and enter more of on at the end of the month, that kind of stuff. It was like the early version of first computing stuff. Lots of stuff. Uh, IBM is doing that with power. Yeah. It was interesting in uh, early 2000s. We get an upgrade in mid-2000s for our mainframe. And the guy who was there, he was not high yet. He was our regular engineering support person. He asked us all to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> he took out a live chicken. Or <laughs> chicken. And we all came back and there was another CPU activated. And the difference was all of our software prices went up. Because we had more CPU money. Right. Uh, so the software costs were we were. Uh, but um, yeah, technically, I find this interesting because you're figuring out a limb of CPU with keys and stuff like that, and you're back to the concept: is this back to being uh, later on? We talk about blah binary large objects and stuff like that. Or what level of control are you having of your system again? Because um, it's supposed to make it to 518, which is right around the corner. Yeah, so this one's actually quite repetitive. This is when I was getting tired, you can tell, because this is a slide that just seems to repeat itself. Um, like I say, I, 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 this one I actually tend to repeat this because what's interesting is there's not been a lot of discussion, but this is just pretty much just right in. No real feedback, nobody throwing a real fit about it. You, because you know, I mean, the, all you gotta do is get two Debian guys in the room and you've got three opinions about something. <laughs> so. You know how it goes. I mean, it's amazing this one has gone through, but it, it's a, 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 a change, but all of a sudden it gets back to the concept of do you own the computer? What level of control over it do you have over it? What can and can't be done with it and stuff? Are you running a cloud at your house? Are you gonna be able to get a machine five years from now with a thousand cores where you used to pay per core per time with some sort of billing going back to Intel or whoever they uh, license that out to over time? That's just a really weird thing in there, isn't that? Could seriously change things because we're talking some big changes are coming down in the kernel in the next umpteen releases because there's going to be some additional stuff we'll be talking about later on new CPUs and stuff for there. Really weird, right? Chris says more reasons to go to ARM. ARM is not a panacea for all things yeah, because ARM itself also you can you can look at ARM's CPU designs pretty easily and so that and come with the basics of it. But you still have to pay licenses. There's still to deal with patents. If you want true freedom, you have to go with uh, a, a later topic on here. Once again, Bruce is just like about four slides ahead. I, if you got, did he get a copy of my slides? But that's just an idea. Now he's pointing at this spot. Yes. <laughs> God damn it. Don't read this anymore. But uh, firmware in the kernel. Uh, how free do you want to be? Uh, a lot of devices, if you get a Wi-Fi card and you want to be able to run it, you more than likely are going to have to load up some binary large objects to get access to it. 
or to be able to get full access to it. Some people manage reverse engineer certain cards and stuff like that in lower versions where you can't get AC running, you can get N running or G running or something like that. But you have to, what are you willing to trade off in terms of freedom and to have full source for your kernel, to have full control of everything? Uh, this goes back many, many years. There's never been a, an end to it, but it's just come back around the Debian groups, are, which is where I spend most of my time because I tend to run Debian for the most part, are having another uh, brouhaha over this part of my But uh, OpenBSD back in 3.9 had a release they called Attack of the Binary Blob, which was their uh, fighting against this. And the, the, the OpenBSD guys fight pretty hard against this all the time because it's just the way it works out. But um, yeah, <laughs> there's a great site, the Debian Gotham Needs, which is nothing but a pointer to the latest uh, unofficial version of Debian that has all the proprietary mm -hmm. firmware in it. So if you want to install a Debian system without having to install the firmware later, that is a great site to hit. It's just a link to the latest version of it. So it's always kind of nice. Um, as we go back to number seven, it's only a matter of time for a CPU that will require a binary blob to run or run full speed or something like that. It's going to be interesting. I mean, reinstalls are going to be a nightmare. Yeah, it all depends on is the key locked into the kernel or is it, uh, is, is it on the CPU inside its memory or is it something you have to load every time? Because if you look at the uh, build, the some like kind of stuff that pushes out to the yeah. CPU, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you're talking about that. You're talking about. What how does that get saved? How does it get initialized? One of the problems I had for the company I was dealing with was um, they bought these Dell machines, which did hardware encryption of the hard drive from the main board. And my question was like, where are those keys at? What happens if the main board goes out? Their response was, huh? It's <laughs> just one of those signs that things are going to be good. And they turned it on and they uh, were very happy with it. And uh, my contract ended before they ever had any problems with it, so I consider it to be a success. And I don't know if there's, I don't know if they're still around or not. But there's some projects out there like Linux Libre, which is a compiled version of the Linux kernel, which without any binary large objects in it, it can be worthwhile to go out and install that PPA on an Ubuntu system or get it go out and grab some Debian packages, try it out and see what percentage of your hardware does work with totally free kernel. Just, just for more experiments and patient anything else. Yes, Dave, you had a look. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here and thinking about, you know, a couple of hypervisors that I've worked with. One of them is, of course, the big PDF, and then the other one is uh, Foxbox. And I'm wondering, how much will they get to get like this? Yes. So, yeah, I'm really plugging in. Uh. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's kind of cool to see how it works out. The uh, Linux Libre project, there's also the, the uh, GNU project has what they consider to be the free versions of Linux. There's a uh, TriSQL or something like that. It's got some weird names. And there's a, a version that's uh, of Ubuntu. They've chopped down all the, all the binary large objects out and stuff like that. It's not a bad thing to experiment with. Don't get rid of your regular kernel. Try the new kernel, see how it works for you. Like on my home desktop, I mean, I've got this HP 260Z. It works perfectly good without any proprietary drivers, except for my NVIDIA card, really not quite the same with the new Bow drivers. So I uh, I gave in. <laughs> I went back. I went crying back to NVIDIA, please help me. Please help me get 3G speeds. I want to see this stuff go fast. So uh, it's interesting. It's all right, though, but it's a worthwhile experiment. Try it out. You've learned a couple of new things along the way. Maybe what not to do, not to listen to me, which potential would always give me on that list. Um, <laughs> this one is going around right now a little bit. Removing Intel x86 support. I, I'm actually cheating on this one because it's a variation of uh, it's a, a, a small subset they're removing of it. Uh, when do we remove support for the Intel x86 platform? Because there used to be this great, uh, the power of PC chips used to work pretty well. You could buy Decent MacBook, pretty cheap when it's used, and no longer could run Mac OS X. And you could actually just load uh, Linux on it. It would be a pretty good little machine, though. Some of those MacBooks are actually pretty good battery life, good screens, all that stuff. And it's just, uh, they, they quit supporting it. There's some groups that still do some support. Hell, there's a company, there's a group out there called Aurora, still working on compiling up Red Hat 7 something odd for uh, Spark. 
no one's ever letting go of anything. That's the great thing about uh, the Linux. Linux, you don't ever have to let go. You can just keep going forever and do whatever you want to. Yeah. 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 But uh, this one is kind of amazing because 386 is what made Linux. Let's be honest. The capabilities that were in that chip made it. But you also look, if you dig into the assembler and the way and the design of the 8088, the 8086, the 8186, 8186, all of those, they are just a bastardization of the Ziglog Z80 that they've just kept adding on to. And every time we've made a change to it, we've just put another layer of crap on top of the previous layers of crap which is why Itanium was gonna fix all that. <laughs> and then Itanium had its own uh, uh, career, let's put it that way. It didn't have its thing. So there's there's talk about when do we remove x 6 support. There's talk about the Debian group talking about dropping support for their, once, once the districts drop, start dropping support for it, after that point, the kernel drops support and so on and so forth. But keep in mind, this can take years to happen. There's talk now about removing the riser file system still. Riser three, which is yeah. I mean, Riser five is thirty-two. Yes, yes. Well, it depends on when he gets paroled or not. Right. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a little dark too. That may have been too soon. But uh, it goes back to how do they figure this out? Because it would clean up a lot of stuff. The same way if they removed uh, BIOS support and they just went to UEFI, that would make a lot of stuff simpler. You would lose a lot of use a lot of stuff. Like if you look at what they're buying in terms of PCs nowadays. You can't really buy a PC that has like a lot of the, some, some of the newer PCs, uh, some of the newer HPs and Dells and stuff. No, you got no choice. There's no BIOS back, uh, safe boot, anything like that. You got to go UEFI, which is kind of the way it's going. Um, but keep in mind that there's a lot of embedded systems x86, so we got a long ways to go until that's going to be uh, an issue. But it's something that's being discussed more and more. What CPU architecture do you want to support? Is it enough to support ARM and x86 AMD64? Is that do we want to have it quite well have two or three or four architectures that are supported? Is it nice to support these weird edge cases and stuff? There's somebody out there who wants to continue supporting and keep it going. I mean, does I does do you really need Linux in your mainframe? Can you afford Linux in your mainframe? Um, this discussion mostly is about dropping uh 32 bit x86 8 on support. So x86 will continue, but it's starting the process in the beginning. And if you want to figure out how to keep that going, you can always uh, use bin format mist to reload it and stuff like that, which I've done some research on. But it's just an interesting concept. Are they going to remove Intel x 6 support? What is it going to support? What isn't it going to support? C++ and the Linux kernel. We were talking about this a little bit before we talk, did, this, did the talk. Um, Right now, Linux kernel is written in 95 plus percent in C with a bit of assembler and shell scripts and stuff like that to keep it all, make it all happy. Um, C has been described as having all the power of assembly with all the convenience of assembly. So it's got its own thing. There's a new language out called HARE, by the way, H-A-R-E, which is a new embedded systems language. It's supposed to be like a 30 year newer version of C, which some people are playing around with now and saying it's really kind of impressive to I'm kind of curious if that's going to have a shot at uh, getting into the kernel with some other uh, other languages we'll be talking about in the next couple slides. But it's uh, interesting, interesting times. That's the great thing about it. It's still innovations happening. Um, there have been many, many attempts to get C++ accepted in the Linux kernel all the way back to the 90s. It never seems to get accepted and it never seems to go away. It's like a professional, it's, well, it's kind of like purpose. You think it's gone away and then it comes back every couple of years. <laughs> I'm proud of that one. I'm not, not ashamed of it. Not really proud of it, though. I mean, just, just like, yeah, it's all right. But um, yeah, it's uh, the closest it seems to have made has been some of the drivers. Some people tried to add it over time. Uh, C++ has a much larger size. There's been some efforts. Some people, I think, have gotten their code in. Because if you look at some of the drivers, you see it looks a lot like code generated by Cfront which the way C++ used to actually compile was, there was this thing called C front, which took C++ code, turned into C code, then compiled it. And some of the code in the kernel looks a little bit like that. Like someone did that just to get it in there, which they did, kudos to them. Because there's also, um, speaking of uh, uh, compiling to C, like if you look at the GNU COBOL compiler, some of the COBOL compilers out there, they compile it to C, then they compile it to uh, executables from COBOL. So that's, 
how you do it. But um, it goes around, it comes around, it keeps trying to do it. The problem is C++ is a pretty large language and Torvalds is never going to probably accept it. He's put up a really good fight over the years. His, their response from a lot of people is they tend to do a um, object-oriented type C with the naming conventions and stuff like that. So they don't really feel they need C++. And the overhead of it, they don't feel it necessarily is worth it. But it keeps going around. It just keeps going round and round and round. You'll see every now and then some grad student or somebody else who's got too much, once again, time on their hands will come up with a new version of this and a new requirement. So they keep trying. Rust. There you go. Bruce, are you happy now? Is Bruce happy? Yes, smiling face. <laughs> so Rust is going to make it into the Linux kernel. Rust will be the second language except in the Linux kernel. That is a big deal. That says a lot about the language and the capabilities of it. Uh, Rust is a general purpose language. It's been designed for type safety, memory concurrency. It's pretty well designed. It looks like a much newer version of C with some C++ type features in it, stuff like that. Um, once again, it's gonna be the second language actually supported inside there. Uh, the main idea is Rust is ideal for writing device drivers. And that will probably be the main focus of for some time. Why that's important? Because if you wanna write crappy code, and get it in the commercial market, there's no better place to do it than a device driver. Because people will accept it. If you want to see the worst code you've ever seen in your life, yep. take a look at some of the device drivers that have been written for Windows or for other companies like that. Because keep in mind, any idiot who can come up with a, can buy, go out to AliExpress and come up with a mouse mm -hmm. pattern or something can get a device driver authentic code key and actually generate code that will be signed by the, the Windows and led into, the, into their kernel to have fun and play. So if you really want to go after a Linux, if you want to go after a Windows machine, you actually have physical access to it. I recommend go buy a Razor mouse and use that, that uh, wonderful backboard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's going to be a huge thing because the idea about it is if we can get the point where we can actually have more control of the device drivers in our, in our world, because that's a lot of cases, some of the proprietary code and the waste of time, this should make a tremendous difference over time because that is where a lot of problems end up at. Because that code is, by, by its nature, the device driver code is a much, much smaller percentage of people are going to be using it. It's developed usually by a company which only has so much money they're going to put into it. And once a project is shipped, how long do they have support for it? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. An example of this is the um, Paragon NTFS drivers. Has anybody been aware of how this worked out? All right, there's 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 my winner. That, he's my favorite, by the way. Yeah, but uh, so Paragon wrote this NTFS driver. It was commercial for a long time. They decided to open source it. They made all the code available. It got sucked in the Linux kernel. It has been in the Linux kernel for about a year and a half now. Yeah, about a year, year, year and a half ago now. But the thing about it is, they're not accepting patches for it. They're kind of like they're just the main authors of it. So it's just kind of in a a state where it's not getting fixed, it's not getting enhanced, it's not getting anything because the device drivers, the guys, they turned it over, they kind of thought, eh, we're kind of done with it now. They're not getting money for it anymore at that point. I don't blame them. But if, if, if it comes back to there's a, there's a couple of gentlemen who are offering to be like co, co uh, authors and stuff up to trying to get the, break the back jam and backlog and all this stuff going. So that's kind of interesting. But there's, you can write it in better languages with fewer bugs, fewer stuff better memory stuff, all that kind of stuff happening, it is really nice. So I highly recommend everybody go a little bit of rust because it's going to happen for us. And that is just, I, it's a change. I never thought it would happen. I thought Linux would go C++ or would go rust, or we would pick some other language out of, out of the thing like Cyclone or something like that. But you're going to play a Cyclone, it's a nice state we're going to see. It's kind of interesting. It's like, oh, right. But it's very cool. Um, one other thing that's kind of cool is there's a whole OS written in Rust called Redox. Redox just hit 0 0.70. It has a windowing environment. It has, a, I mean, it has got a little GUI. It looks a little bit like Linux. It's got kind of a similar look. It's, everything, and it's written in Rust. Everything's happy and stuff like that. What would be interesting is that in 10 years from now, GNU Herd uses the Redox kernel in the GNU, <laughs> GNU user space. 
and finally ships. <laughs> Another possibility is over time, maybe the Linux kernel will be written more and more in Rust and the Redox kernel will become the Linux kernel, which is a possibility. And then Linus Torvalds just be known as that guy who came up with Git. <laughs> but there's a lot of interesting stuff happening here. The thing about it is Redox is actually evolving. It's being a usable OS. Uh, someday, depending on how old uh, many people get signed for the next couple uh, of Oleg's things, I might be talking about Redox. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, there's also a project to rewrite all the GNU core utils in Rust as well. I'm kind of interested to see how that goes. Uh, GNU core utils is fine, diff, du, all the basic utilities you need. And they're working at that. There's like another guy, group of guys working on rewriting BusyBox in Rust. BusyBox, if you ever play with embedded systems or like boot disk or something, is one executable that has like all the basic stuff you need in it. It's got PS, LS, all the basic commands, and they're all just sim linked to the same executable. And it first thing the executable goes like, "Hey, uh, what's the what name did you call me by? LS? Well, I'll do LS things then." And BusyBox written by Bruce Perrins and stuff like that. And it's a cool thing. It's alright, but rewriting BusyBox in Rust will be a very interesting thing to see how small it is, how fast it is, how easy it is to extend it, how readable it is. There's stuff going on here to compare how it's going to be. There's a real challenger to see for now, which is something that I've not thought we would see in a long time. Because I honestly thought uh, OS would just get uh, absorbed into system D over time because that's the way that everything else is supposed to be going. But <laughs> what? I don't know. I'm not sure on that. I just need to look into because I'm actually digging into the open work for another project. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. No, BusyBox. I thought you were talking Rust. Ah, yes, BusyBox. That's what open WRT ships with by default. And a lot of the, like, uh, if you used to use some of the other smaller versions of Linux and stuff like that, like the uh, back in the days, there used to be this day many, many years ago when you could actually boot Linux off a of floppy. And BusyBox is almost always used by that project to just keep it going. Uh, number two. Lattice encryption. This is something that's still evolving, figuring it out. Um, quantum computers are happening. It'll be 10 to 15 years, maybe, before they're re really available. Uh, with Shor's algorithm, public key cryptography might be vulnerable. It will be, let's just be honest. Because uh, Shor's algorithm was really good at figuring out prime fa uh, factors, factorials, and stuff like that are related to each other, which is when all the uh, public key cryptography is largely based on, depending on the version. That could be really bad for things. And there's working and trying to come up with new standards and stuff like that to combat it. Uh, AES is very resistant to short, is, is, is perfectly resistant to short's algorithm. Quantum computers have a very hard time figuring out AES right now from what, everything we know, because it's a symmetric key algorithm. It works pretty well for that stuff. As long as you use longer keys, don't use the shorter ones, use the 192, 256, and you should be safe for some time. So there's talk about going to the other ones inside of the, um, the uh, crypto subsection of Linux kernel. There's a lot of talk about that kind of stuff going on. Uh, why does this matter? Well, if you're a nation state or a company or hackers, and you can grab like, oh, Dave's traffic, John's traffic, Lewis's traffic, anybody's traffic. And it's like, I had to store that for 10 to 15 years where I could use a quantum computer on that. Yeah, but depending on what you get, it could be worthwhile after 10 to 15 years. Because who knows what information is going to be useful in there, especially you're talking about nation states. Because, well, that's really interesting stuff there. That's kind of stuff you really want to know. You're going to store off time. Because I mean, think of it this way: though. any young kid is yeah. doing social media stuff that's encrypted. Oh, yeah. Ten to fifteen years, they won't start running for office. Perfect example. <laughs> yes, all your picks are going to be available. All of them. <laughs> but it comes back to the whole concept of that, how that's going to be resolved and how we're going to support that over time. Um, whatever the standard is, it's probably available in the long. Uh, this is currently running, uh, this round three evaluating the post quantum crypto algorithms. It's some interesting stuff. I got the link at the end of this slide, stuff like that. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the people who turned Rindall into AES. They did a hell of a job evaluating everything. But if you, if you ever go into the modules and the encryption mod subsystem of Linux, there's a couple of uh, various impl implementations of this algorithm, that algorithm. It, it's a really interesting place because that's one of the that's the main place that I my contribution to Linux kernel have been made is putting some of the algorithms in there. 
like the wool pulling tiger hash, stuff like that. I'm mostly on the hash side, so I thought that was interesting. But it really is a, a dynamic place. They, they keep going back and forth on it, but you also got to make sure that your stuff passes certain tests. And I took, it took me a long time to figure out. One benefit I had, which I need to get back, is I compiled all my code for multiple architectures. I did it for x86 and Solaris at the time, so I had big Indian, little Indian, all that kind of stuff. And once they say, once you say you compiled your code on multiple architectures, they're like, oh, that probably is somebody who's actually done some testing on <laughs> so we'll take a look at it. So I managed to get some of the stuff in there, but they're still evolving that up. But it's going to be interesting how it goes in there. There's always going to be that stuff. Maybe one of those other people will use some of those other algorithms that will go in there directly and they'll just go over time and evolve and stuff like that. But it, it's, a, it's a cool place. It's one of the uh, models of Linux that's got some really good moderators and stuff like that. And it's, it's one of the easier ones I have had luck with uh, getting stuff in because my, uh, well, we, we'll talk some other day about my TCP drop experiences. So, uh, Someday I will get that in the kernel if I don't care what I have to do. But it won't be today. And number one, <laughs> Bruce's predictions have all come true. Uh, risk V support. This one is a big one. Risk V is analogous to ARM, except for a few things. Risk V is actually open source. You can get a, you can use ARM, you can actually see a reference implementation of it. You can use some parts of it, you have to license it to actually to do an implementation of it. It's ARM chips have made humongous strides lately. Anybody who's played with the uh, newer MacBooks and stuff like that are going to realize how amazing they are, how fast they've come, how far they've come along, the way they're handling them. Putting the uh, memory, the cache, the CPU all left together on one chip is amazing. It also makes you the point where you can't update your system at all, which is where software defined uh, execute uh, enhancements might be a re actual real thing to consider there. But it is kind of cool in its own right. Um, Risk V is going to be used by countries that don't want it to be dependent upon Intel, AMD, or other manufacturers. Keep in mind, if let's say you're a, a nation that just invaded some neighbors somewhere to the east of where they live, and they decided to not like oh like various parts of it, and they end up in a state where they have no real control over this stuff over time. Can they develop ARM chips? Not really. They can use what they currently have licensed and they can go over the license, but still they're going to end up going to the WTO and that kind of stuff. And they're not going to get newer versions of the implementations and stuff like that. They can try and take the current ARM chips they have or the current AMD licenses they have and try and shrink that, go through all the work of that, try and build a very high tech foundry. Which is going to be able to do net, uh, additional nanometer, the four nanometer, and so on and so on and so forth and stuff, and xenon graphs and all that kind of crap that you read about when you're hearing about chips talking about the next generation and Moore's law. Or you can go get the risk of easy time and take it wherever you want to. Right now, it's not as, it's, uh, I think, uh, 10 nanometers, what will they tap on that right now? But you can take it smaller, but there's like, it hasn't been quite as evaluated. But it's cool because it's truly open. So if China wants to actually come up with a competitor to their long-term CPUs and their other ones that's not the problem. But the Soviet if Russia wants to do it, I was told the Soviet Union, that's how old I am. They're working getting back to that. Uh, I was going to talk about any country, Iran, Iraq, or H, whoever it is. They can, they can do, they can take a stand and they can move it. They can actually try and move it forward. And yeah, there can be a coalition between the groups and they can contribute back to the open source stuff. Just this <laughs> open source license just to I don't remember the name, but it's actually truly open source. You can actually get the full chip. If you want to go out and find a fab, a fab foundry to actually make you your own risk V chips, you can. I'm just curious if you just about GPL licenses that prohibit use in your. No, not that I'm aware of. I, I could be wrong in that too. But keep in mind, the GPL doesn't have anything about war. Right. Yeah, but I mean, it can be used by anybody. I mean, there have been attempts to create open, the open source license initiative had huge fights about this in the past about are you allowed to exclude various groups and stuff like that from it, from this reason or that reason, and in terms of embargoes and stuff like that. But it's, it's an interesting thing in its own right. Is it manufactured now? Risk me? Oh yeah, you can buy them. How much of an ecosystem is? It's evolving. There's actually desktop machines right now available you can actually go out and buy. Okay. But they're very small. There's one called the Mango Pie, which is actually cool. Because the Mango Pie is a Raspberry Pi competitor. Many of us may have an architect yesterday. 
Actually, let's go take a look at this one since we're doing well in time. LilyPewding.com. If you don't hit the site, you should hit it because it's a great site. It's one of my favorites. Well, what? Oh, it helps you spell it, right? It's a test to make sure you are all awake. You fail. So Mango Pie, MQ Pro, 20 bucks, Raspberry Pi, zero size competitor with a RISC-V processor. <laughs> If you go to the Pine store, you can buy a soldering iron with a RISC V processor, a RISC V processor, right now. It uses it for a little bit of stuff. It looks like a TV 100. That's, uh, yeah, that's the dev term retro. Uh, single board computer. Ooh, there's tons. Yeah, Intel invests $1 billion in third party chip development, joins RISC V International. So there's going to be some development and enhancements coming along there. Yeah, uh, the $17 Slip Heap Lit Litchi RV is a fully functional. Okay, let me share it back out again. Sorry, we dropped you guys for a sec there. So that's some of the capabilities of what a risk of VL offers. It's, uh, and let's go out to AliExpress because you've got AliExpress. And there's a way to search for, uh, not a lot of that. I can't let that keep on going. Hmm. Yes. Yes, the uh, SCP, FPGA, all sorts of little stuff. There's all sorts of risk V stuff coming up that's available over there that you can get your hands on. It's an interesting chip. It isn't as fast a chip right now, but how fast a chip do we really need for some stuff? Think about in all our times in the Linux kernel, anybody who's played with it and stuff like that. What's been the single biggest change in Linux from the last 15 years has been probably in the, in the Linux ecosystem in the Raspberry Pi. It's changed the way the world looks and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what is that really? It's nothing but a cell phone that runs Linux. They took the guts of a cell phone, they took the screen off, and they got the price down to a very low price. And I'm thinking there's a possibility that this. Well, I was just pricing a Raspberry Pi 3. How much? $240. Yeah, chip shortage is a bear. Yeah. Don't select buy it now all the time. <laughs> but no, there's a, there's a point. There was, I was looking to buy a couple uh, Raspberry Pi Zeros uh, for a project I want to do. I want to take a whole bunch of Kandinsky uh, paintings, put them on, on, on the machine, and just set up a, a thing just to run that as a slideshow at a, a place that I may spend eight hours a day or not. So it comes back to the point of what it can do. I mean, the risk B is going to change stuff around. Because keep in mind, every time we've supported a different architecture, it's shaken out a whole lot of bugs in the Linux kernel. It's improved the quality of the Linux kernel. Every time we've done it, every time we've gone to another newer version of the compiler, we've done this, that, or the other thing. The uh, Clang improved a lot of stuff in the Linux kernel. The Mandrake guys deserve a lot of credit for doing that, supporting that, because they figured out a lot of stuff in the kernel. We're figuring out a lot of stuff. Anytime we've gone through and compiled the Intel C compiler with Gen 2 and stuff and submitted bug reports, that's improved it. Uh, when we started supporting ARM, we learned a lot of stuff. When we took um, Linux, when it was very early in this like 0.97 phase, which is many, many years ago, which once again goes to show how old I am. Um, and we took it from being just working on the Intel chip and we started supporting the PowerPC chip. We started supporting this chip, that chip, other stuff. We started supporting Spark. We learned so much about it. We figured out a lot of stuff. We found a lot of bugs, a lot of cases that don't show up in here. And we improved the overall quality of the system. And that is what is going to happen with Risk V. And Risk V is going to keep stuff going. It's going to bring it into new spaces that we currently aren't in. It's going to bring in smaller chips, cheaper chips, and just it's going to keep it going. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Because some of these uh, Risk V boards we're talking about is uh, like 128K, which of course, as we all know, 
is not really enough to do a lot of stuff. 120 meg, 120, it doesn't have team K here, I'm team K there. But you start getting back to the points like getting it really small because you can't get uh, Linux to work on an ESP32. ESP I've seen how much you can chop it down. You can run Mongoose on it, but you can't run that on it. But it's a whole concept of what it can do. The RISC-V is amazing chip, amazing design. Well, just because look at um, the Raspberry Pi foundation to help people buy and how much do those cost? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> I was looking to buck one actually the other day, and they got something one twenty five dollars for them. They built me four bucks. RPI locator. RPI locator. But it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this shakes up. I think this is going to be the next thing that's going to take Linux into a space that's not currently at as much. Because if we can actually get to the point where it's getting to the point where we're talking like everybody remembers seeing really bad cyberpunk movies. Well, I do. The 90s when people were wearing cyber decks, they had the uh, little uh, screen on their arm and then they had the uh, little keyboard and all that stuff. This is getting closer to that. We're getting closer to the fact that you can support that and afford it. Um, RISB might get enough mice to actually influence Linux development over time. That's because ARM is thinking about the changes it's made to it. There's a lot of stuff to get supported in there. I mean, right now, if you go out to uh, like uh, AWS or Oracle's free cloud tier, Oracle's free cloud tier, you can now get four CPUs worth of ARM CPU for free using the use of server stuff because it actually works out that well for a price range. So it's a very interesting thing going. I'm kind of curious to see if risk fees can build have that kind of effect. Um, a student computer built out of risk fee chips, I want to see one. I've seen uh, there's the 8,000 Raspberry Pis put into a case by Oracle years ago. I thought, hey, that's pretty darn cool. I want to see somebody do the same thing with RISC-V and then actually put out a source code for it and say, hey, here's the diagram you want to build your own. Because one thing to keep in mind, we're talking about the ability, you can actually theoretically fab however many cores you want on a piece of silicon. So if you can get a big piece of silicon, you can make a lot of chips on that. And you can see the wafer. Yes, one big ass wafer can add it to a lot of capabilities. It's an interesting design capability, and I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, like I mentioned, fully supported is shaking a lot of bugs out. It's going to continue to shake a lot of bugs out. It's going to find things that we don't know about timing issues. Because one of the best ways to attack the system is if you're going after things like uh, uh, race conditions. Uh, time to use uh, uh, something being free to being used again before it's actually garbage collected or would have reallocated by the system. All those kind of things. And now we're opening up a whole nother set of runs against the uh, against the Linux kernel. It's going to be different timings, different things. It's going to find things we don't know about. It's going to lead us to new areas that we need to improve on. It's going to be cool. I'm looking forward to it. And the mango pie, which I have not ordered yet. But I'm going to order one someday soon. is is a very cool Raspberry Pi competitor. It's just a cool thing. So that's all I got. I didn't talk about a bunch of stuff that we could talk about inside the Linux kernel. So Linux kernel is always dynamic. There's always stuff going back and forth on it. There's the guys still trying to get crypto mark in it. There's if you if you subscribe to Linux kernel mailing list, it is a tremendous amount of fun. But it can also just be something where you can just be a rabbit hole. What? Yes, a fire hose with not filled with water. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. But there's a lot of stuff in it that is very interesting because it's still, think about how little other OS has changed. Windows 10 to Windows 11. A lot of stuff changed underneath the thing, but what we've seen in terms of the, the design stuff we haven't seen, a lot of times when Windows changes, people aren't happy. I mean, I, I know people are still whining about Windows 8 and Windows Vista years, but you really don't hear people whining that much about it. Uh, our regular OS is uh, the Linux from 5.16 to 5.7. But you hear them lie about GNOME because GNOME seems to be on this uh, hell bent for leather to try and take every feature you like out of it and throw someplace else. Even though some people love GNOME. That's why I'm a KDE guy. But it's it's an interesting time. It's still amazing to go forward. It's, it's the workflow. I like the workflow of GNOME. That's all it is. <laughs> it's still for KDE and KDE to get to work like GNOME. That's all it is. It's too much of a pain in the ass to get Gnome to work like now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I want to be able to get the Windows key and open you everything I have. That's, that's like legitimately the main thing I like. Or you just click the uh, 
their mouse button anywhere on the screen that you don't have in a window, and it'll do that with KDE. I'm going to shut it off. Shut the recording. I won. I won. <laughs> I'm trying to I really have. I'm it a good Still really don't, like it. don't get me wrong, Katie is going to cruel, but sometimes I run Debian test. Keep in mind, Debian testing, right before they freeze is when things start getting really dicey because you're trying to get that last patch in. And I've got no or Sim or Mate on my system because every time before Debian releases their next release, it will break KD at least for two or three days. And then I'm like, well, I can go off to unstable and start pulling packages out and maybe get it to work. Then I'm thinking like, oh, that'd even be crazy than what I'm doing now. <laughs> so yes, there's a, all of them have fun. But uh, it is interesting to see how it goes. I mean, Cinnamon's a great desktop. Mate is, I like, uh, I mean, Gnome is good too. I've been using that a bit more lately because I had no choice in a couple of areas. But it's, it, it's phenomenal. The whole ecosystem of it is, all this is based upon the work done by Torvalds and those kind of guys. And Torvalds work was still standing on the shoulders of other giants. There was a whole load of the GNU user space that was available when he started Linux kernel. Because they were just waiting for the herd kernel to come along. And he came up with a kernel that worked halfway decently, and then people just went, Let's, we can keep working on that, we keep an ass at that, or we'll wait for, wait for Godot and the herd to show up. No, so. You may never reach for the news. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's one, of, one of the projects I really loved was this, there used to be this version of Debian called K3BSD. It was Debian, and it ran with the FreeBSD kernel. And it was like the most unhackable system because nobody could understand what it did in terms of naming everything. I love that system until System D came along and went, nope, not for you. You love it, it's got to die. I mean, the Duvian guys haven't brought it back. And I gotta say, if they did, I would be interested because it was one of the ones I would just put out there to let people hack on. I would set passwords to things like password just to see if people try and actually figure out what to do once they started got into the system because they were like, oh, these paths aren't right. <laughs> But it's interesting. But the kernel's still going forward. Still stuff is happening. It's really a cool environment still. I recommend taking a look at it. If you haven't built the kernel in a while, give it a shot. It's not that tough. I mean, then you just add it to the grub, <laughs> add it to your boots, and then you just uh, go, man, I didn't do that right. Then you go back to the other kernel and you can play around with it, or you just make it VM stuff. Or Linux is trash, and they're a great place to go and build, build the whole system from. It'll get you up a long ways along. You learn a long, long way. I learned a lot figure out what I do with the kernel over the years, and this helped me figure out stuff today and the problem solving with all IT stuff. That's all I got. Anybody got anything else? Bruce? Does Bruce have any com comments? His last one was not a snap back of his so he said good job. Oh, well now I feel bad. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, hey, sign, somebody sign up for next month unless Dave wants to present again, which we, Dave doesn't want to do. Uh, I do. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. I'm going to end the recording. I'm going to have to edit that in later. And see.